This is Radio Eco Shock with Alex Smith. Civilization may begin to unravel just 30 years from now if we cannot mount emergency action to save a livable climate. From Australia, David Spratt explains the warning heard around the world. Climate-driven storms, droughts, and fires are coming much sooner than scientists predicted. Now, an Australian report suggests civilization as we know it could break down starting as early as 2050. It comes from former fossil fuel lobbyist Ian Dunlop and Code Red author David Spratt, with an introduction by Admiral Chris Berry, once Australia's former top military officer. It's called Existential Climate-Related Security Risk, a Scenario Approach. It was published by Australia's Breakthrough National Centre for Climate Restoration, and it got incredible press coverage and viral social media buzz around the world. From Australia, David Spratt returns to Radio EcoShock. Welcome back, David. Thank you very much for having me, Alex. So, David, what do you mean by an existential risk to civilization? An existential risk to a system is a threat or a risk that would either undo it or so damage it that it would take a very long time to recover. In terms of climate change and human civilization, it means that human civilization, the culture which we have developed, particularly over the last two or three thousand years, would be severely battered and probably unrecognizable from where we are today. And this is not just our words. Professor John Hangel from Sheldon Huber from the Potsdam Institute last year said that we are now reaching what he called the end game in climate change. And recently he gave an interview where he said that if we continue down the present path, and I'll quote him so it's accurate, he said, there is a very big risk that we will just end our civilization. The human species will survive somehow, but we will destroy almost everything we have built up over the last 2,000 years. Now, that's a very eminent scientist and advisor to people like Pope Francis and the German Chancellor. So that's what we're talking about. Just to be clear, you and Ian Dunlop are not predicting the world will end right at 2050, and as you say, that humans will go extinct then. So what are you saying? Look, our report is in two two parts. The first is an argument about how we think about the risks of climate change. And it's been my observation that a lot of the policy making is around the idea, look, there's a 50-50 chance, a 50% chance of something happening, which is really in the middle of the range of the possibilities. I mean, if you're an engineer and you've got a steel girder which you're putting into a, into a building and you could say, look, There's some risk that this might bend, Mm, okay. There's some risk that it might crack, not so good. Or there's a risk that the girder could actually snap and bring the building down. You would say that high-end risk of the girder snapping is the thing that you need to look at and avoid. So what we're saying with climate change, let's not focus so much on the middle of the road outcomes, but look at the high-end outcomes and work out what we have to do to avoid them. Uh, my co-author, Ian Dunlop, uh, spent many years in Royal Dutch Shell, and one of his areas of expertise was in risk management. And he says all the time, you have to ask the question, what is the worst thing that can happen, and how can we avoid it? And so the first half of our paper is really making that point very clearly. Let's look at the high-end risks and how we avoid it. The second half of the paper is to say, well, what would a high-end risk be? And um, we know from the Paris Agreement and the commitments that were made there that at present the world is on a path to three degrees of warming because the commitments have not been strong enough. If you're adding some of the climate feedbacks, perhaps more than four degrees of warming. So we have simply said, if more action is not taken and we get to three degrees by 2050 in our scenario, it could be 2060 or 2070, what would the consequences be? And that's what the paper is about. David, if I get a fever, we know medically about what point, uh, what temperature that I would probably die. But do we know what level of warming civilization can withstand? Well, this is a very difficult question because, you know, we have a certain degree of knowledge about the physical sciences 
then we have to translate them into the human impacts. We know, you know, we know some of the physical impacts. I mean, one of the papers that really influenced me was a paper published last year which asked the question, if we get to three, four, five degrees of warming, how many days, particularly in the tropical zone, would people experience heat which is simply unlivable without air conditioning? And in some places, if you get to four or five degrees... Uh, the answer is more than 100 days a year. That is, those countries become unlivable. So we have a good understanding of those physiological impacts. But what are the impacts on human society? That depends on a whole lot of complex interactions. What are the impacts on the water supply? Where will the water move? Where will lands desertify? Where will be more rain? Will the uh, productivity of crops decline? The fertility of crops decline with temperature? Yes. Do we have to add in this concern about uh, a rapid drop-off in insect population? So this is a, a complex algorithm. I mean, we can say, for example, that the World Bank put out a report a few years ago, and they said that we may not be able to adapt to four degrees of warming. The World Bank is saying four degrees might be too much for us to survive, to be able to adapt. And if we don't do that, we know what happened. Last year, one of America's um, leading climate scientists, Roman Arthur, published a paper with co-authors where he said he thought that more than three degrees would, in his terms, be catastrophic. So I think in that three to four degrees range, we're really talking about impacts and consequences for human civilization and, and for many human societies where the conversation is almost difficult to have. Why do you say climate is a security risk, with backup from Australia's former chief of the Defence Force? Well, look, Alex, I think there are many ways to talk about climate change. Traditionally, a lot of the early advocacy and and concern and work was done by what you and I would call green or or, uh, environmental organisations. You know, you think of names like Greenpeace or the World Wildlife Fund and nature conservation groups. And that, I think, has led... uh, in some areas to people, particularly in business and government, seeing environment as a green or environmental issue. And, and it is my view, it is, it is not a green or environment issue and it should not be framed that way. This is a, uh, an issue about the safety and protection of people and nature. I mean, we know that the first duty of a government is to protect the people. Broadly speaking, I mean, whether it be their their physical security, their safety, the laws we have about safety at home, on the workplace, in swimming pools, social safety nets, uh, the health and medical care and so on. I mean, it is the idea of the safety or lack of safety of people that I think is important. So coming from the national security, uh, which is really about human security in the end, the the security of, of people to have land and water and food and be able to live is a different way of telling the story that engages different audiences. And I think for some governments and some parts of the bureaucracy, it's a fruitful conversation to have. The mainstream prediction is up to three degrees warming by the year 2100, but you're suggesting that we might reach that three degree mark by 2050 instead. How does that happen? Well, that is simply by taking the literature that is out there. Um, there is a there is a tendency in some of the projections of the IPCC, I think, to underestimate the future rate of warming. For example, they put out a, a report last year on 1.5 degrees, where they said, "Look, we think the future rate of warming will be 0.2 of a degree per decade, so we'll get to to 1.5 about 2040." But there are half a dozen peer-reviewed papers that I can quote to you, which simply run the climate models, which show that for various reasons, the rate of warming will increase and will be at 1.5 in 2030, not 2040. I mean, this is this is materially important because this is the lower range of, of the Paris aspirations. And uh, a paper by Zhu and Ramanathan just ran out the models on the assumption that we're not doing a lot more than we are now. I think we are decarbonising at you know, 1% a year which is about what we've been doing, and they said by 2050 we could get to around 2.5 degrees. And then they said, by the way, there are three feedbacks that we have not included in this modelling which could add on more. So we've taken three degrees by 2050 as uh, our scenario. In fact, their paper says there's you know, a 5% chance of more of getting to 3.5 to 4 degrees by 2050, given 
the, the range of probabilities. So three degrees by 2050 is towards the high end of the range of impacts, but there, those are the impacts we need to look at, but it is by far from the top of the range. And whether we get there in 2050 or 2060 or 2070 probably doesn't matter for the purposes of the argument too much. It's the fact that three degrees is where the lack of political will is taking us at the moment. If this terrible scenario becomes reality in 2050, you suggest the global food system will break down and perhaps up to a billion people will have to migrate to survive. That sounds pretty extreme. Is it really possible? Well, look, it's not my words. For example, there's a UN report which we've just referenced in our in our paper which looks at conflicts over land. And they said that in their estimation, in another 30 years, by which they meant 2050, a billion people in the world would even need to fight or flee because of the shortage of land on which to grow food. So here's the UN saying... Just on land shortage, conflicts over land, a billion people might need to to fight or flee. Then we have the other drivers of of this location, for example, rising sea levels. We know, for example, in Bangladesh that a one-metre sea level rise would would inundate 20% of the land and displace 30 million people, I mean, one country. Then we have the other issues such as the deadly heat, the lethal heat, where people will have to move because it's simply too hot to live and grow food there. So it is a complex interaction of different different drivers. Land shortage, desertification, changing monsoons, sea level rises, deadly heat. And I think that the, the one billion figure is not unreasonable. Look, we don't know. I mean, it might be half a billion people, it could be more, but it is certainly numbers that would be un- unimaginable now. I mean, we look at what's happened in Syria where some drought and desertification in the east of Syria displaced a million people internally, and then there was the, the Arab Spring driven by rapidly rising uh, grain prices as a consequence of climate events in Russia and China, and there was political domestic issues as well, of course. But together... Those events have internally and externally displaced 11 million people in and around Syria out of the national population of 17 million. And some of those people migrated west into Europe with incredible political consequences for, for the European Union, for, for Brexit. And this is, you know, this is just a microcosm of the future. That's one small country. So you multiply that out and, you know, we have a, a terrible vision of what will happen unless we really tr- treat this, as the United Nations Secretary General said recently, as the emergency that it is. 2050, I doubt we'll make it that long. Am I the only reporter who says that? Uh, no. Look, uh, I think there are a lot of people very concerned about the future. We have had an incredible response to this report. I didn't think we were saying that many things that we knew because, in fact, Back in 2017, some American national security analysts, including a a former head of the CIA, put out a report called The Age of Consequences, which said the same things. In that report, they said that if you got to three degrees by 2050, in their terms, the world would be likely characterised by outright chaos. And they said the internal cohesion of nations would break down in the international system. The relations countries be, between countries would break down. I mean, this was Washington saying this 12 years ago, so this should not be a shock to people. Will it come early? Will it come later? Look, Alex, it really depends on whether we are prepared to say, as a, as a national and global society, this is the biggest issue we face. This is an issue that's actually bigger than all others. If we don't solve this issue, all the other things we're concerned about uh, might simply become irrelevant. That's the question that's before us now. I mean, I was really taken uh, by an interview that the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres gave uh, just a few days ago, and he said, look, he said, we, are, we need to sound the alarm. This is his words. This is an emergency. This is a climate crisis. And he went on to say that in politics, there's always a trend to keep the status quo. And then he said the following, which I'll quote you exactly. He said... The problem is that the status quo is a suicide, unquote. That's the UN Secretary General. So that's the conversation we're having now. So I think, you know, many people are now beyond alarm. 
check out the Radio EcoShock website. We're at ecoshock.org. You are tuned to Radio EcoShock. I'm Alex Smith. My guest is David Spratt, author of the book Climate Code Red, The Case for Emergency Action, and many worthy reports since. And we're talking about a scenario where civilization starts to unravel as early as 2050. David, why do you think this breakthrough scenario went so big and so viral? Look, Alex, I don't honestly know. I mean, uh, we put out the report. We had an opinion piece in The Guardian here in Australia. It was picked up and an article ran on Vox. I think there were some, um, there were some over-the-top headlines. We didn't say, well, the civilization would end in 2050. What we said is, if we don't act, the high end impacts of around three degrees will lead to these consequences, which have have severe, uh, very severe impacts for the civilization as we know it, and for displacement and and and, and social breakdown. Um, which to me was all unremarkable because it had all, as I said, been said before. Maybe we live in a more viral world. We know that. Within a few hours of that box report, I just tracked 12 stories on 12 different websites, and they had Facebook interactions that measured 600,000, and then it just spread into um, around the world, and um, there's, been a, a, there's been a lot of coverage in, in German and Scandinavian newspapers. So I think beneath this all, that there is a change in the conversation about climate change. I think... People now realise that it's really a big, tough issue more than they did before. After Paris, there was elation that this incremental deal would do some good, and it's obviously not. And if I can point to two or three things, I think the the honest, brutal nature of the conversation that Greta Thunberg has started has been really important in the student strikers in calling out the adults. And she really calls it like it is. I think that's been important. If you look at groups like Extinction Rebellion in the UK, they've been calling it like it is. I mean, they, 10, as you know, 12 years ago, we wrote a book called Climate Code, Red, the Case for Emergency Action, which sort of established the, the, the idea that this was a, a climate emergency. And now you have groups around the world campaigning for climate emergency. You've had almost 600 local government councils declare recognised climate emergency as a way to step it up to political change. So I think there is a new realism uh, about it. There are also some sort of doomers, we're all doomed sort of people out there, um, what I call gurus of the apocalypse, whose analysis I think is wrong. But there is a more gritty conversation now, and maybe you know, by the luck of, our, of the draw, our paper slotted into those circumstances. News agencies asked a few climate scientists to fact-check what they called your doomsday scenario, and it seemed what they printed most agreed you were projecting real possibilities. Have you had feedback from scientists? Yes, look, um, I noticed that um, USA Today quoted a a professor of applied physics at Columbia University, Adam Sobel, who said, this scenario is, quote, don't seem that far-fetched to me. I don't think there's anything too crazy about them. A new scientist um, uh, quoted Mark Madison from the University of College, who said, the University College London, who said it added to deep concerns, and he said maybe it's time for our politicians to be really worried I noticed one or two people said that, you know, what we said was a bit over the top, but I think there is evidence for every statement we've made. Um, I think some scientists are quite rightly a bit worried about the sort of doomerism, uh, apocalypse-driven narratives we're getting from some people who just say, it's all too late, there's nothing you can do, throw up, throw up your hands, go bush, you know, put your money under the bed, buy a whole lot of tin food, which is ridiculous and naive and, and, and childish. So I think scientists are reacting to that. But we have had very little criticism of the peer-reviewed science on which the scenario is based. Of course, the scenario is somewhat thinking into the future, but I think it's well-grounded. And and look, the response. There have been some very thoughtful articles. Um, one in Al Jazeera uh, was extremely good, and, and uh, one in a German magazine called Climate Reporter, where they looked back at what Shell and Hoover had said, our What Lies Beneath report last year, a little film we did called The Home Front about the national security implications, and wrote a story saying, look, beyond some rather 
clickbait headlines about utilisation coming to an end, there is a serious point being made in this report. You know, science can only operate with data from the rearview mirror. I just interviewed the lead author of a paper about the heat deaths that will occur in 15 major American cities by 2050, and but their model was based on numbers from 1987 to 2000. It doesn't include new developments like the increase of multi-continental heat waves or the appearance of back-to-back heat waves that I've covered recently on the show. So I'm worried now that science is dangerously conservative in its structure. Your thoughts? I think we talked last year about our report on, on what lies beneath, which tried to look at um, at some of those issues. I mean, science is conservative in several ways. First of all, you don't say something until you can prove it 10 times. It's not the balance of probabilities. It's, you know, it's evidence that, that really can't be disputed. So there are a lot of things that are going on you can't say. I mean, one of the really telling criticisms of the IPCC is that they're really obsessed by computer-driven models, and we know that those models can't deal with certain things. I mean, this is, first of all, the data and the evidence from the past on which you base the model. And because we are now in a climate system which is now has more greenhouse gases than at any time since modern humans walked on this planet, we don't have the data analogues on which to, to do some of this. And then, of course, those models can't deal with the, what you know, we call the nonlinear events. Uh, it's not the temperature going up and there being more uh, water vapour in the atmosphere and winds perhaps being stronger and driving stronger cyclones because the sea surface temperature is higher. That's all well known and a fairly uh, predictable response to increasing levels of of warmth in the system. But it's the nonlinear systems where the ice sheets flip, where we start to mobilise the the permafrost uh, in the polar north or where we lose something like the Amazon and and a lot of carbon goes in the atmosphere. These nonlinear system step events are not well included in climate models because, in fact, you often don't know them, as you say, except in the rear vision mirror when you say, oh, look, it's already happened. That was the research about West Antarctica in 2014 where they said, we think that this system has already flipped and doesn't need any more energy to produce a multi meter sea level rise. So, yes, it is. In that sense, it is structurally conserved, and that's why I think the expert opinions of scientists saying, I think, given my knowledge, the, the models, the, the climate history, my level of you know, expertise, I think that X is going to happen. So, you know, when somebody like John, John Huber says, I think there's a big risk that civilization will come to an end and we will destroy almost everything we've built over, over the last 2,000 years, that's the sort of expert opinion which, to me, is as, as valuable as a whole lot of climate models which can't incorporate all the physical processes. Right, and they don't take into account the fact that governments may not continue to function. I mean, history shows there can be government breakdowns or the grid can go down, and uh, there's just so many factors that aren't allowable within the scientific model. Yes, I was going to say, this is the big complex issue that, um, you know, we have these capacities to produce science about the physical processes and perhaps, you know, desertification and changing availability of water. But then you've got all those human issues uh, uh, as well that can be, that comes in. I mean, one of the issues that is happening in in emergency management services in Australia, and I know in the United States as well, is what happens? Do we have the capacity if we've got two or three simultaneous crises at the same time? You know, what happens if we've got a huge wildfire in California and a typhoon battering, um, a cyclone battering Florida and inundation somewhere else? Do we have the emergency service capacity the human capacity to deal with three or four crises at once, and the answer at the moment is no. So, you know, this is territory where a lot of a lot of concern is being developed, and that's why this discussion, which we have about risk management, really connects in with those sort of people. David Spratt, is it possible the terrible scenario you and Ian Dunlop describe will not happen, or will not happen for another century or two? Well. That depends what we do. You know, one can be pessimistic or optimistic about the capacity of the human species to not create the conditions for our own extinction. The record so far is not good in that we have been decarbonising and reducing the carbon intensity of production very, very slowly. We now have to do this at an incredibly rapid rate. We know from uh, study of past climate history that the last time 
we'd had this level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere a little over three million years ago in the Pliocene. Temperatures were three degrees warmer, which is is our uh, scenario, and over time, sea levels back then were at least 25 metres high. So we have already gone too far. Are we prepared to say this is an existential crisis? This is something that could bring everything we care about to an end? I don't know. I mean, I was really heartened where Will Stephan, um, who you and your readers might know as a professor of climate science from Australia and the lead author of the Hothouse Earth paper last year, which was the most downloaded um, peer-reviewed paper in history of the the web, I think. And, And he last year said, look, in Australian context, he said, we have to get emissions down fast. This means that it has to be the primary target of policy and economics. He said we need something like a wartime footing. Now, when he says it's got to be the primary target of policy and economics, I think that's the key issue. Are governments, uh, are business leaders prepared to say stopping this terrible possible outcome has got to be the primary target of politics and economics? If we can get to that conversation, then I reckon we can get out of this. Well, just to end on a terrible bright side note, if civilization collapses within one generation, would that solve the problem of climate change, leaving the world a better place for the rest of the species? Oh, Alex, I don't know whether that's a question I can answer. I mean, the problem we face at the moment, which was in the recent Stefan Hothouse Earth paper, these days said that you know, there are circumstances where the feedbacks where the system keeps on driving itself upwards. If you can trigger enough of the permafrost, but even if we stop burning fossil fuels, the release of carbon from the permafrost you know, will drive another half or one degree of warming. And there are other feedbacks like that. If we get to that point where we have, we have triggered the system so it, it will keep on going even if we're not here, then the answer is, the answer is no. That's the danger. Is there anything else on your mind that you would like to talk about? I would just say uh, I've been doing some work with a lot of young climate activists and and there is a lot of deep concern about what's going on. I think some people are being too influenced by some of these gurus of the apocalypse and we really have to have an understanding of the system and where it's going that is scientifically based. Gavin Smith, the head of NASA, and Kate Marvel both made the point that as it gets warmer, things get worse, but you do not get to a certain temperature where the world ends. I mean, it's not that 1.45 degrees is all okay and 1.55 degrees is terrible. I mean, there's not a moment where the lights go out. Uh, And I think some of the reporting, even some of the reporting on our policy paper, done by people who are not all that experienced in science and science reporting, tends to want to have that all or nothing moment. And and that is, is a distraction and not helpful. You can find the short and shocking new report from David Spratt and Ian Dunlop absolutely free at www.breakthroughonline.org.au. I will add further commentary and follow-up links in my own show blog at ecoshock.org. Follow David's work, as I do, at his blog at climatecodered.org. Thank you for telling us about your new work, David. Thank you for the time, Alex. I'm Alex Smith for Radio Ecoshock. You're listening to EcoShock Radio for the world. I'm Alex Smith. Get it all at our website, ecoshock.org.